Jesus says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth till now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved.
Let's pray. Oh Lord, truly, you are worthy of all praise. And Lord, what a privilege to be called sons and daughters of the living God. And you have called us, Lord. You have called each of us into your kingdom. Lord, thank you for that privilege. And thank you for being the special father that you are. You are the father to all of us, Lord. And you are the perfect example of what a father should be. And for that, we're grateful. We'll forever be grateful for you, Lord God. You are so awesome in all your ways. Your love for us, we can't even fathom. You love us even in spite of ourselves. But Lord God, you are so good. You are so great. So Lord, help us to focus now on what you have to teach us today. Help us to learn from you, to sit at your feet, and just to grow in our knowledge of you and our respect for you. Lord, thank you for giving us to each other. Thank you for taking us into your kingdom. Thank you for your great love. Help us to focus on you now. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles on you this morning, please turn to Luke chapter 15. Uh, we're going to go through verses 11 through 32 this morning. The title of my message this morning is God's Heart for the Prodigal. Let me begin by asking you a very important question. And you might say, well, it's a very obvious question with an obvious answer. But here's the question. Is your heart broken by what has been unfolding in the news lately? You know, when I think about what I see around me, see around us, what I see on Facebook, what I, see, what I look at the media... Uh, I have never seen the country more divided. But here's the crazy part is that what makes it even worse is when Christians add fuel to the fire. What do I mean by that? What I've noticed is that during this time of division and hostility and craziness in our world, I find that Christians feel a need to attack and retaliate rather than reach out and pray. You know, I think we are viewing this ever-growing chasm between a couple of things. Number one is this, is this idea of God and country. Uh, because for many years we have held to this idea, right, that, you know, America, Christian country, we're going to be okay, right? We're, we're, we're not like the rest of the world. And the more that you look at our country today, the realization is that America is more in need of Jesus than any other time in our history. Matter of fact, America is in more need of Jesus just like the rest of the world because America is part of the world system. And listen to my words, it will not surprise you and I one day if it turns against Christians. Amen. It is what we are witnessing in our world today. So the question we need to ask ourselves is this. Where are the Christians? Where is the church? Where are the reconcilers and ambassadors within the body of Christ? who are not going to sit back, but who are going to engage the prodigals that we see in the world today. There's no doubt that you and I get upset when we look at the stuff happening in the news and we get angry. But do you realize something? They don't know Jesus. It is a manifestation of the flesh. It is evidence of someone who does not know Christ. And while we can sit back and judge and say, well, look at them, look at their behavior... Was it not for the grace of God intervening in your life and my life, we would be doing the exact same thing. Amen. Matter of fact, even when we come to church this morning, there is stuff in our hearts that no one was able to see from this past week, but God does. And when we compare it to God's holiness and righteousness, we literally are no better than the people that we are uh, going against and, and castigating all the time. Jesus has some very important words for us about how we engage the prodigal. And that is my message to you this morning on Father's Day. We're going to look at a very familiar passage. Hopefully I'll be able to bring some stuff out that you've never thought about before. But I want us to see what Jesus has to say regarding how God approaches the prodigal, the outcast, the rebellious individual. Matter of fact, if you look at verses 11 through 32, probably 12 to 13 times, you are going to see the word Father. Because it is all about the heart of the Father. What does God desire His people to do and to be? Let, let me set up a little bit of a context as to what Jesus is going to go into in this passage. And the context is found in the first two verses of chapter 15 and verse 10. Look at the context. 
Verse 1 and 2 says this, Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him, to be near to him, that's Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And then verse 10, it says this, Likewise I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus has been talking about this lost sheep. The shepherd goes out and seeks the sheep. Jesus is talking about this lost coin. This woman finds this lost coin and there is joy. The context is, is that God does not isolate himself from those who are lost. He reaches out to them, but then he also calls them to repentance. He doesn't just say, I know you're a sinner, I'm going to accept you, just continue to live in your lifestyle, and I'll be okay with you. No, God says, I have died for you, I have redeemed you, now I need you to turn to me for salvation. So there's three important things regarding the context of this passage. Number one, God has a heart for lost people. God cares about lost people. The people we get irritated with and we cannot stand. God loves them, and He sent His Son on their behalf to die in their place. To die in my place. Number two, God wants sinners to repent, not just stay where they were, but to turn, to be transformed through the power of the gospel, this transformation that happens from the inside out. And number three, both the accuser and accused are dealt with in this parable. What do I mean by that? When you look at verses 11 through 32, much of the attention and focus is on the young son, who's the prodigal, and the father. It's obvious from the context. But Jesus also wanted to speak to those who were religious, who were self-righteous, who made it out to be that they had it all together on the outside, but their hearts were far removed from God. Jesus wanted to address those people as well. Can I tell you that in 2020, when we look at the church today, there are a lot of people who are not like the father, who aren't like the young son, but they're actually like the Pharisees and the older son. They think they have it together. They think they know God. They have religion on the outside, but they are so far separated from God. God wants to reach out to them as well. I begin in this passage in verse 11. Here's what the Bible says. Jesus speaking, this third parable, he's talked about the lost coin, he's talked about this lost sheep, now he's going to talk about the prodigal son. Verse 11 says this, Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. Now from a surface level, if you're reading verse 11, you say, no big deal. The younger son is coming to his dad and saying, Hey, I want part of the inheritance. No foul, no problem. Matter of fact, when you look at verse 11, you'll see that he says portion of the goods. Another word which commentators have used is the word estate. The estate basically supports the life of the family. And the son says, I want a portion of the goods that fall to me. I want the inheritance. What is the problem with this young man's request? An inheritance could not be received until the father had passed away. It's literally like the son, young son going to his father and saying, Hey, Dad, I wish you were dead. A shocking statement by this young man. Almost like wishing his father was dead so that he could receive his inheritance. Now, it's also important to note that there were times when the father might decide to distribute the inheritance early, but it was initiated by the father and not the son. So think about what is happening here in verse 11. Jesus draws our attention. He's been building up to it. He has been talking to uh, those who are sinners. Then he goes into this example of the lost sheep. The shepherd chases after them. The lost coin. This woman has joy. And now he brings their attention to these two sons and this father in the sea. Now if you're a Jewish person and you're listening to Jesus speak these words, you're thinking... Jesus is going to say that the father is going to smack the child and he's going to throw him out and say, don't ever come back home. That's probably what's going through their mind. But when you look at verses 11 through 32, he's going to absolutely shock them because he's going to show them the true heart of the father. Notice there is no contention. There is no argument between the father and the young son. At the end of verse 12, it just says this. So he divided to them his livelihood. Now, 
It is very important that you notice this one word. It says this, he divided to them. Both of them received the inheritance. When you and I studied this passage growing up, I always looked at this passage and thought to myself, only the younger son was a fool. He got the inheritance. Woe is me to the older son. He's such a victim. He didn't get anything. Notice it says, both of them received the inheritance. The older son was not left out. They received the livelihood, his father's life and possessions. Now notice what else you notice. Not only is there no argument between the young child and the father, but the older brother does not protest, and according to the law, he receives his double portion based on this parable. You already see a hypocrisy going on here. Jesus has the audience of the Pharisees and the scribes, the sinners. He goes right into this parable, and they know exactly who he's talking about. This older son does not contest. He does not say, hey, Dad, I'm not going to be like the younger son. I'll wait till something happens, and then I'll receive my inheritance. Scripture says here, he divided to them his livelihood. The older son got what he was supposed to according to the law. Now look at verse 13. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. It is possible that he liquidated all of his assets. Now, when you are reading this parable about the older son and younger son, some of you that are older siblings, you're like, yep, that's just like a typical younger sibling. Irresponsible, don't take care of anything, want to do their own thing. You know, you always have to go after them and try to help them and rescue them from danger. But then you also have the older sibling that's very responsible, that, that, that tries to do their best, right? And so when you're looking at this passage, some of those family dynamics are pretty well understood. So this younger son, he takes his father's inheritance, probably liquidates all of his assets, and the Bible says that he goes away, he journeys to a far country. Now, notice the words far country. It is important because Jesus is stating not just a change in geography, but also a change in morality. If he stays close to dad, dad's going to hold him accountable. Man, but if he goes far away, no one's going to tell him what to do. Not just a change in geography, but also a change in morality. He, he goes away to a far country. Matter of fact, when you look at the Old Testament, there's another individual by the name of Jonah. What does Jonah do when God says, I want you to go to the Ninevites? He decides to go away to Tarshish, to a far country. He decides to get away because he doesn't want God to hold him accountable. A question I have for you this morning is this, two-part. Number one, how many Christians do you know of still today that are in the far country? They're, they're still out there. They're away from the covenant of God, the promises of God, from the church of God, from fellowship with God's people. There are a lot of Christians, whether they got hurt in church, whether they struggled with something, whatever reaction they received, they find themselves in the far country. There are people in our lives, literally living in the far country spiritually. They are far away from God and His promises. They don't know Christ as their Savior. They live in our lives. This message is for you. They're in the far country. And the Bible says here that He began to waste His possessions with prodigal living. Now, the word prodigal... It can have a positive meaning. It can mean an abundance of something or plenty of something. But in the context of this passage, it is talking about abundant sinfulness. He was living a depraved and degenerate lifestyle. Think about this. If you're a Jewish person listening to this, it's important that we understand the context of Scripture. There is so much that I have learned about the Bible when I study the background of it. So, for instance, in an American culture, here's what happens in a Western culture. In a family unit, if you have a child that rebels, and they end up going away from the family because they can't stand the family, whatever the dynamics were, 
Generally, the community will have sympathy for you and will empathize with you and say, man, I'm so sorry that happened to you. You guys are such good people. I can't believe that happened to you. We'll be praying for your child. But if you think about it, Eastern, ancient culture, even today in many Asian nations, you have to think about this. Asian nations are a shame-based culture. And so if you in this context are reading what is happening here, not only is this son bringing shame to himself, he's bringing shame to his entire family. His actions are a reflection on the entire family. It's a shame-based culture. So the Jewish audience is thinking to themselves, my goodness, what did the father do wrong in raising such a prodigal child? He, he's dealing with all of those things, right? This is how bad it is, because if you look at verse 30, we'll get to it later on. The older son says to his father, This son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, who killed the fatted calf for him. That's a pretty depraved lifestyle that he's been living. Verse 14 says this, But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him to his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods, these were like carob pods, that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Notice, Jesus is not again shocking people. First shock is this, that the son asks for an inheritance. You don't do that till your father has passed away. You're literally wishing he was dead. Number two, now you're living a prodigal life. You're bringing shame on the entire family. But number three, it says here that he goes to the far country. He's run out of everything. Now he's interacting with pigs. If you're a Jewish person, you are going to be in shock when you listen to this condition. Why? Because look at Leviticus chapter 11, verse 7. It says in the swine... Though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud, is unclean for you. Jews do not associate with pigs because they're considered unclean. Here's a commentary note that says this. Jews avoid all association with pigs, but this young man is reduced to serving pigs, setting their table, bringing their dinner, enduring their pushes and shoves, smelling their odor, tolerating their manners, envying their privileged status, even coveting their pig food. <laughs> he, he is in a destitute situation to the point where he's not out there and he's not having bacon, right? He's not doing that. He's not having a barbecue. By the way, if you want to eat the best bacon I've ever tasted in my life, you need to go to First Watch. <laughs> they have what's called million dollar bacon. $4.99 for four strips. It's, it's maple glazed and man, is it good. Okay? So first watch, if you're watching here, I expect a discount next time I'm here. Okay. So, so he doesn't get to have this privilege of eating this good bacon. No, he's left to whatever their scraps are, and even that, he's not allowed to have. Look at what it says in these verses. No one gave him anything. He hit rock bottom. Isn't it just like human beings to tell God, I know what I'm doing, I know where I'm going, I don't need your help. And when we ignore God, what happens? We find ourselves at rock bottom. I know we all like to be individuals. I know we all are, are strong in our personalities. I know we all think we know what we want to do. But when you are running away from God and being disobedient to Him, the end result is not Happiness. The end result is emptiness. You know, Ravi Zacharias, one of my favorite preachers, apologists, recently passed away. There's a quote by him that has always stuck with me, and here's what Ravi used to say. He said this, At the end of our pleasure isn't more pleasure. Instead, we find that there is only pain. When we live in a broken world, we think that stuff and self-gratification is going to satisfy our souls. And when we've accumulated all of it, and when we have all of it, all of it, we still find that we are empty. Why? Because the human heart was never supposed to be satisfied outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Folks, I got news for you. You can fill up your life with all the stuff you want. 
You can have money, you can have prestige, you can have houses, you can have the best job in the world, but if it is missing Jesus, you've missed out on everything. This young man had hit rock bottom because he decided to satisfy his flesh rather than satisfying the will of God, his Father. Proverbs 14, 12 says this, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. You read chapter 14 of Proverbs 14, it's all about choosing the way of life or the way of death. It is the same for all of us, all of us with a sinful nature. We seem to know what is right, but in our flesh it only leads to the way of death. The wages of sin is death. There's another quote, I don't know who said it because so many times many people take credit for it. It says, watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. This man went his own way and is now reduced to the same level as pigs. He is at the bottom. He thought he knew what he was doing. He had all of his dad's inheritance. He had liquidated it. But he goes far away and he ends up wasting all of it. No friends. Hey, his buddies that used to party with him, it's not there anymore. He is left to himself. Look at verse 17. It says, but when he came to himself, he had a aha moment. He woke up, he came to his senses. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever had that aha moment? I, I hope you have. Where you are like, man, this is so stupid. This is so wrong. This, this, is, this is not what God desired for me. And you just wake up and you have that moment. You know what the, one of the, some of the best times to have the aha moment is when you're at rock bottom? Because the only thing you can do is look up. How many times have you been to talking to people in the hospital? I visited with so many people, and they said, man, my relationship with God now looks different. Because my health, I thought it was okay, but now it's in a crisis. And you see people over and over again, when they hit rock bottom, you have nowhere else to go. The only place that you can look is you can look up. This man was at the bottom. He had his aha moment. I think about the Romans chapter 13, the passage that I preached on a few weeks ago. Here's what Paul says. And do this knowing the time, that now is the high time to wake up out of sleep, for our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness, let us put on the armor of light, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry, drunkenness, not in lewdness, lust, strife, and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Wake up. You and I need to have an aha moment. You are not going to live on this earth forever. Time is short. What will you do with what God has given to you? Now notice verse 17. He is at rock bottom. But he is going to start having the conversation with himself. Now, have you ever had a conversation with yourself and you found that when you were in a car and people started looking at you? <laughs> kind of weird, isn't it? Like, it's just this time when you're just like, man, I just don't care. You and I have conversations with God all the time. Not just we verbalize them, right? He's, he's talking to himself. He is reflecting. Let me give you some, some words of advice. You would be surprised what some solitude will do to your soul. When you just get away from the craziness, you just sit back and you reflect on your life and what is happening. So here's the conversation he starts to have. He says, how many of my father's higher servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will rise, go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. First of all, he says, I have sinned against heaven. 
he knew that he had sinned against God and brought shame to his family. But notice also that his intentions are not to go back as the son, not to go back as a landowner, but he says, I want to go to my father and say, Dad, take me on as one of your hired servants. Why does he say that? Look at the word hired servants. William Barclay says this. He says, the ordinary slave was in some sense a member of the family, but the hired servant could be dismissed at a day's notice. He was not one of the family at all. He's, he's, he's at rock bottom and he's saying, I know that dad is not going to take me back as a son because of what I've done to him. I know that dad is not going to take me back probably as a slave to serve around the house because people are going to point and say, oh, that's the son that rebelled against you. He says, I'll just go back as a hired servant just so I can have something to eat because even that is better than the condition that I find myself in. Now, here's where this is important. Let, let me share, like, even if I don't get through this message, hopefully I do, but here's what I think is important for us on Father's Day. He thought to himself, if I just take on as a hired servant or a hired you know, slave, whatever it is, I'll get to eat, and it's a lot better than this. But do you realize in this entire conversation Here's my point here. His hope lay not in the things he possessed, but in remembering who his father was. That's so important when you look at this passage. He's having this conversation. He knew he messed up. He knew he screwed up. He remembered that he had burned the bridge and not his father. You know what his hope lay in? His hope lay in the fact that he knew who his father was. Man, that is so important for all of us. That even when I mess up in my life, even when I'm rebellious, even when I screw up, I know I can go back because I know who my father is. I can hope because I know who my father is. I can have redemption because I know who my father is. I can have forgiveness. I can have a second chance. I can make it because I know who my father is. We can keep going back to God in brokenness because we know who our Father is. This young man had burned the bridge, not his father. Let me ask you this question. This is a tough one for some reflection. In your severed relationships in your life, who burned the bridge? If you did, here's my advice to you. You need a general contractor to rebuild that bridge, and that bridge's name is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will help you. The Holy Spirit will guide you. The Holy Spirit will, will make possible what is impossible. The Holy Spirit can reconcile what you can never do in your own strength. If you didn't burn the bridge, keep looking for opportunities to restore the relationship as much as possible. He remembered that he had burned the bridge, not his father. I love this quote by David Guzzi. Here's what he says. The lost son demonstrated the repentance Jesus specifically spoke of in the previous parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. After his misery, he thought completely different about his father, himself, and his home. The son asked for two things. First thing he said was, Father, give me. Then, Father, make me. Only the second request brought joy. That's powerful in your life and my life because too many times we approach God with give me, give me, give me, rather than saying, Lord, make me like your son, Jesus Christ. So important. Look at verse 20. It says, he arose, came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion on him, and ran and fell on his neck and Neck and, kissed, neck and kissed him. A couple of things here that I want to know. Number one, a famine had become the instrument of the younger son's starvation. Only at the bottom was he willing to consider returning home. God often uses adversity to bring us to our senses. In most cases, we cause our own misery, but God always stands ready to redeem our misery. 
God is in the business of making Easter's out of Good Fridays. Here's another note by Charles Spurgeon. He says this, He did not go back to the citizen of that country and say, Will you raise my wages? If not, I must leave. Had he parlayed, he had been lost. But he gave his old master no notice. He considered, concerned his indentures by running away. He says this, I would that sinners here would break their league with death and violate their covenant with hell by escaping for their lives to Jesus, who receives all such runaways. You know what the church needs to say today in 2020? Come to Jesus because he'll take you. Come to Jesus because he's waiting for you. Notice the reaction of the Father. The Father, I can almost imagine this, right? You know, I almost picture like a big open field, you know, this, this home that he has in the desert. And the sun, as he's walking away the first time, you know, you kind of see it around the horizon in the desert. And then all of a sudden it disappears. I can almost imagine the Father waking up every single day, going out and looking. And looking at the field and going, is the sun coming home today? Man, I'm coming home, going back. Wakes up with joy the next day. Is he coming home and he's scanning? You know, you don't know how long this has been happening. And I think about the long-suffering nature of God. He's so long-suffering towards us. But one day, the Father sees the Son coming. And the Bible says that he runs to him falls on his neck, and he kisses him. Why, again, is this important culturally? Because for a distinguished father to run, especially after a prodigal, in that time would be seen as undignified. An older man in that culture doesn't run to someone in this almost shameful thing. Because you're older, you have experience, you are elderly, people come and give their respect to you. But Jesus is showing to us the heart of the Father. The Father runs to those who are lost. You know the greatest way that the Father ran to us is through His Son, Jesus. Look at Philippians 2, 5 through 8. All of us know this, but look at the power of these words. <clears throat> Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He suffered on our behalf. Shame. He was shamed on our behalf. This father, he didn't care whether or not he looked dignified because his concern was the Son. <clears throat> it is what God did for us through Christ Jesus, that he would suffer shame and ridicule the cross because he loves us. You know what's funny is, you, you never see this reaction, honestly, between fathers and sons. You see it between a dad and his daughter, but you never see it between a father and his son. Look at what it says here. It says he ran and fell on his neck and he kissed him. In the original grammar of the Greek, it literally means that he repeatedly kissed him. You know why I love these verses? Because you know how Christians oftentimes portray God? They portray, uh, portray him as someone who's angry 24-7. God's just angry all the time. Look at the Old Testament. He's angry all the time. All he does is destroy sin and he hates sin. It's all true. Folks, he's also a God of grace and mercy. He, he is a God of love. Yes, he hates sin, but he's done something about it. And he's reconciled us through his son, Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that God is holy, but we also acknowledge that he is graceful and merciful. And we should be conveying that through our lives every single day. Verse 21 says, In the sense said to a father, I have sinned. Against heaven and in your sight, and no longer to be worthy to be called your son. But what I love here is this the father cuts him off. He's like, man, save that speech. It just saved it. He's, he's, he's rehearsing and basically saying what he's been rehearsing. And he's, he's about to go into this speech. The dad cuts him off because he's so overjoyed. Verse 22. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, 
and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Not the reaction the son was looking for. If you were the son, you were thinking, okay, dad's going to put me in a corner room. He's going to probably make me stay outside somewhere with the animals, just like I was. I'm going to get to eat, but he doesn't want anything to do with me because of what I've done. But the grace of the father exceeds infinitely the sin of the son. God's grace in your my life and uh, my life in your life, your sin is no match for it. You know how often I have people tell me, man, you don't know what I've done in my past. You don't know my sin. I got news for you. Grace covers it 10,000 times over. Right. You and I will never be able to repay what God has done on our behalf through Christ Jesus. Never in a million years, you and I will never be able to work it off. Grace, unmerited favor for you and I, sinners, once and for all. He has this issue going on, but he gives him a robe. It was for guests of honor. He gives him a ring, symbolizes authority, sonship. He gives him sandals. He restores him some type of status. I thought about this from a spiritual perspective too, and I think about Ephesians chapter 2, that passage, verses 4, four through 7. But more specifically, verse 6, talking about God's grace, he says this, He has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Man, I, I'm enjoying this privilege of being called a child of God. And I'm elevated in this relationship. What I also notice here in these verses, and I won't go into the explanation here, but he kills a fatted calf. Now, if you look at that note here, it says that meat was not typically the part of a daily diet. He would serve a fatted calf for a very special occasion, a big celebration. Because it costs a lot of money. So this father... Not only does he put a rope on him, give him sandals, give him a ring, now he's going to have a party for him. When was the last time you heard about a rebellious child coming home and they had a party for him? Because when the rebellious child came home, there was a counselor waiting, dad was upset, mom was crying, shame was brought on the family, and the child knew that it was going to be absolute chaos for the next few weeks and months to come. But this father throws him a party. Are you kidding me? Look at verse 25. I'll wrap it up here in the next five minutes. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. Notice he's, Jesus says here, this talks about this older son. When the Pharisees are listening to Jesus, they know exactly who he is talking about. You know, as you read this passage, this Pharisee, this older son, might represent you. You know what I've noticed? That religious folks are some of the most self-righteous folks you'll ever come across. Church folks are some of the most self-righteous people you'll ever come across. This passage that we're looking at, the Pharisee, the older son, might be you and I. Notice his reaction, verse 28. But he was angry and would not go in. Did he not receive his inheritance? <clears throat> Everything that was in the house was his. He was the older child. According to the law, he would receive it. The older son shows the nature of his heart. You know, I love this one quote by Daryl Bach. Here's what he says. The brother who had been on the outside is now on the inside, while the brother who had been on the inside is now on the outside. God is concerned for the heart. Look at Matthew 21, verse 28. Jesus said, what do you think? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not, but afterward he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, likewise, and he answered and said, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, look at these words. You know, we always talk about offending people, right? That the gospel offends. Look at what Jesus says. Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. 
For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him, and when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. Wow. I got, here's something interesting for you and I know to know. When you get to heaven one day, you're going to be shocked at who's there. You're also going to be shocked by who's not there. We live in a world where people claim to know God. They think that just because I show up to church, that's good enough. But if you have not been transformed by the power of the gospel, there are harlots, there are people that are on death row right now, there are people sitting in prison today who have committed some of the most heinous crimes in the world. They will enter heaven because they found the grace of God, and those who never did such things but had a self-righteous attitude will be condemned for all of eternity. Jesus says these tax collectors and harlots are going to enter the kingdom of heaven before you guys who actually know the law. Therefore his father came and pleaded with him, so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. Now notice his words. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time, liar. Yet you never gave me a young goat, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours, talk about contention there, he has devoured your livelihood with harlots. You killed the fat you got for him. Here's what the older son said. I'm not as bad as those people over there. Man, do church folks say that a lot. I'm not as bad as those people over there. I got news for you. When you look at people on the news and social media that are doing crazy things, in the eyes of God, apart from the grace of God, you and I are just as bad. <laughs> Are you viewing people from your vantage point, or are you viewing people from God's perspective? Notice here, this was important. He believed he had his father's favor as long as he did stuff for him. He was operating on a workspace system. You look into these verses, he says, Dad, I have been serving you all these years. I've never transgressed your commandment. I've been doing all this stuff, and yet you never gave me a party. Romans 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Verse 31, I'm done here. And he said to him, Son, you're always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should be merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Notice the father calls him son. In the original Greek, there are two words for son, but the word that he used, I believe it's called technon. It literally means my child, which means that he's showing tenderness towards him. Second, notice this. In this parable, both sons were prodigals. Both of them were prodigals. Let me close with this quote. It's so powerful. Here's what it says. P.T. Forsyth, he was an English preacher. Here's what he says. The only way to the Father is through the far country. Must the far country be moral dissolution? It may be that, but the far country is the place where you become disillusioned with who you are. You are in the far country at the point where you are disappointed with the world and say, is this all there is? And the Father says, of course not. Come on. You know what our message needs to be to protesters, rioters, people in our communities, at our workplace? Come on. The Father is waiting with open arms. The Father is waiting for a relationship. The Father is waiting to reconcile. And you and I are the reconcilers and ambassadors that God has put into this lost world. Not to escape from it, but to engage it with the hope of the gospel. Let's bow for prayer. God, we thank you for this incredible parable that shows us the heart of the Father. And Lord, I know that we live in peculiar times. We live in a time where people are doing their own thing. They're rebellious. We see division. And then we find that you have placed the church in the world. Not to be of it, but to be those who are reconcilers and those who make an impact. 
Father, I pray that we would understand the meaning of grace when we look at this passage. That grace is not something we can earn. It's not something that we deserve. Grace is evidence of who you are. And that you give it to us in plenty. That we can never work for it. We definitely can't house in your grace. So Father, whatever it is that we're holding it to you know, in our hearts, Lord, thinking that you cannot forgive me, we release it to you right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for in our lives that there are separate relationships and we have the heart of the Father. That we would, every single day, get up and look on the horizon for the prodigal our schools, and our workplaces, and our families, so they can know you as their Savior. Father, I pray that even as you have placed us in this world, even though it's tough, it's difficult, Lord, I pray that we would be Jesus to those around us. May the power of the Holy Spirit convict us and guide us, Lord, as we seek to do your will. And even, Lord, if the world turns against us, as it has for so many people around the world, brothers and sisters in Christ, may we stand in the gap and say that we are following Jesus even if it costs us our lives. Father, just in these few moments, may we reflect on your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your heads bowed, eyes closed. Just between you and God, how has God spoken to you this morning? Not through me, but through his word. You find yourself as a prodigal this morning, doing your own thing, the Father is saying, come home. Pleasure has only brought you pain, come home. The Father has provided His Son, Jesus, on your behalf, come home. Maybe you find yourself as a believer, just hurt by many different things. The Father says to you as well, come home. Find your abundance and your joy that all be fulfilled in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that as we close out our time this morning, may you help us even as we leave this place. Understand, Lord, that when we step out of these doors, it becomes our mission field. And that you have called us as missionaries to share the hope and the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we love you and we praise you. Father, may you grant us your wisdom and may you grant us your peace. And Lord, just help us to be gracious to those around us. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray.